All right, well, I'm excited to be back at it. Here's our, our uh, kind of opening slide and the, the subtitle I chose, Hope for the Hopeless, Mercy for the Weak, Grace for Sinners. And last week in introducing this book and trying to figure out how to get some of the basic introductory information laid and how to orient ourselves, we asked the basic question, why Romans? We made a big deal about fighting folks out for Romans, about what a foundational and fundamentally important biblical book this is. And so why do we regard it that way? And so we had a few answers. The first is because it's next. And here in this session, we've been on a big Bible overview. We talked about all through the Old Testament, the unifying thread of the messianic hope. That we are sinners, everybody everywhere. The chosen people of God, the descendants of Abraham, sinners. Lost pagan Gentiles running amok in various parts of the world, sinners. It's the universal human condition. And the promise of God is to send a savior to rescue us from our sin. The New Testament presents Jesus as that Messiah, as that promised Savior, and he fulfills all these incredibly detailed prophecies, and we'll talk more about that in, in just a little while. Then in the book of Acts, Jesus having paid for our sins at the cross, uh, risen from the grave in power, he commissions his chosen messengers, these apostles, to go tell people what he's done and that they can be saved by trusting in Jesus and what he's done. And so we, we covered in the book of Acts these missionary journeys of the apostle Paul, who was an ardent persecutor of the church. Uh, the, the arch enemy of, of the brand new baby church of Jesus Christ is the first generation. There's a small group of people and Paul was trying to stamp it out before it could turn into the worldwide movement uh, that it was swiftly becoming. And yet he was confronted by the risen Christ and he spent the rest of his days telling people about what Jesus had done. So we traced the footsteps of his journeys and then we went back through and we began to work chronologically through these letters that Paul had written to those churches that he had founded. And so so that task has brought us up to the book of Romans. So that's what we meant there. And then next we talk primarily about this because Romans changed the world. And I made the case that if we ask where did the blessings of liberty that we've enjoyed in the West and certainly particularly in the United States, where do those blessings come from? There's a direct causal connection uh, between the blessings of liberty here and the book of Romans. Uh, that it was the gospel as declared in Romans that, that gave us Western civilization with all its glorious liberty, blessing, and prosperity. And so we went back uh, to the discover the rediscovery of the gospel of salvation by faith alone in the life of Martin Luther. And, and we saw that he was this guy who was a devout German Catholic monk and yet was hopeless, was miserable. He was racked by despair because he realized we have this elaborate system of works-based salvation but that puts the burden on me to remember all the sins I've done so that I can confess them all properly, so that I can atone for them with the acts of penance required. It was just crushing. He couldn't live up to it for all his brilliance, for all his devout faith. It, it, he, it, when it was on him to perform, as the system required, he recognized I could never attain to the standard of God's righteousness. And so in reading Romans, he discovered Wait, it was always right here that God's not asking us to earn our salvation because we never could. He's asking us to trust in Jesus and he gives us the righteousness of Christ when we do. And so that changed the world. The gospel began to spread across Europe. With, with that discovery, people began to work uh, to put the Bible in the language of the common people so they could read and plainly see the gospel for themselves. Uh, in England, in the, between 1500 and 1600, the English Reformation exploded, and from there came uh, the various Protestant denominations that we recognize so well, from the Anglicans, the Presbyterians, the, eventually the Methodists, the Baptists, the Puritans, and it was those folks who came to America and founded our nation, seeking religious liberty, all of it we could trace back to this letter to the Romans. And so that led us to ask, uh, if it's had this profound, significant impact, what exactly is it? What is this letter or this book intended to do? And here's where we were. Romans is the Apostle Paul's presentation of the gospel. And if you think, wait, slow down, you're going too fast, we need to define terms, we're coming to that, don't worry. So handpicked by Christ to take the gospel to the Gentiles, Paul has spent over 20 years in the field, reasoning, explaining, demonstrating from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. Which is to say, in light of that experience, he knows where people go wrong, he knows where they get confused, he knows the questions they're going to ask. So if you thought, you, you, 
I think Christianity is right. I think the answers are in the Bible. I, I hear bits and pieces about this gospel, and I think, yes, there's really something here. I, I need whatever this is, but I have questions. I have concerns. I, I'm uncertain about how this relates to, to religious performance, or uh, w what about the Old Testament? How does that factor into this whole system? Paul knows those questions. He understands those objections, and he deals with all of those issues in the book of Romans. So, through the wise providence of God, we have this book where he lays it all out. And because it's inspired by the Holy Spirit to be scripture down through the ages, it's absolutely perfect. And this is why we're stoked about Romans. So we're here in Romans because it's next, because it changed the world, and because it's this perfect presentation of the gospel that lays out all the details, answers all the questions, it will change your life. Life. And so moving into the text, I just wanted to share this one more uh, quote from Martin Luther from his preface to the book of Romans. This letter is truly the most important piece in the New Testament. It is purest gospel. It is well worth a Christian's while not only to memorize it word for word, but also to occupy himself with it daily as though it were the daily bread of the soul. It is impossible to read or to meditate on this letter too much or too well. The more one deals with it, the more precious it becomes and the better it tastes. So wise words there uh, from the man who rediscovered the gospel in Western civilization. And that brings us to Romans chapter 1. So open your Bibles to the book of Romans if you haven't already. There's a lot going on in Romans 1, so we won't get through the first chapter today, but hopefully through the first half. We're going to try to cover verses 1 through 17 today, and then next week as much as we can of verses 18 to 32. So here's what we're going to see primarily in, in this text. I'm going to try to summarize kind of broad chunks of the book as we go through. Uh, there's great value in teaching verse by verse. That's what we're doing in the main session. But there's also value in moving at a pace where you can see more of the book uh, at, at, at per, per session as we go. And so that's what we're after, kind of paragraph by paragraph. So we'll talk about uh, the author of this book in verses 1 through 6, a little bit about Paul and what makes Paul significant. The audience in verses 7 through 13. Who are these saints in Rome? What can we know of them? And why does Paul write to them? And that brings us... Uh, finally, to the purpose of this book as declared by Paul in verses 14 through 17. So author, who's writing, audience, to whom is he writing, and purpose, why is he writing? Make sense? These are the questions we want to answer. So, firstly, author, as we'll see, this letter is from Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Verse 1. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. And we'll stop there for now and just talk a little bit about this paragraph. And you might think there's a lot going on there. There is, but that's why we're here, to break it down and to summarize. And so the first question, if we're asking, who is Paul? Well, he answers this for us. Uh, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. Each of those terms are important. So Paul is a bondservant. A bondservant is a slave. One who is duty-bound for the course of his life to the service of another. And this is significant that Paul identifies himself in this way. Because Paul uh, was a well-educated, brilliant, credentialed guy. Uh, e even today among historical scholars, Paul is regarded as among the finest minds of uh, of Greco-Roman thought, going way back into Plato and Aristotle. Uh, no matter who you include in, in the calculus, Paul is up there in terms of fine minds that had an impact uh, on the civilization of the world. And yet Paul doesn't say, let me tell you about where I got my PhD or, or, or where I've taught, the universities at which I've taught, or my tutelage under Gamaliel, the rabbi who's still so revered in Judaism. He, he introduces himself as a slave of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. An apostle is, is a word that holds uh, all this kind of r religious uh, connotation to us now. And it's right in some sense because it is an official office in, in the New Testament uh, in, in, the, in this age. Uh, 
Uh, the, the apostolic age died with that first crew of men who were specifically chosen by God, but the word itself just meant a messenger, one who was sent. And so these apostles, people like Paul, Peter, John, and so forth, were men who were literally picked by the Lord Jesus Christ. That is, when we say literally, here is a place where we literally mean literally. And sometimes people say literally, and they don't mean literally. So when I say they were chosen by Jesus to tell people what he had done, I don't mean they felt a call in the shower or they went forward in a church service because they sensed that Jesus wanted this of them. No, I mean they saw the Jesus who had been dead and who is now alive, and Jesus told them, go tell people. Go tell people what I've done and that I want them to trust in me and be saved. That's who apostles were. That's what it was to be an apostle. And separated to the gospel of God. And separated here means devoted to or designated for. That is, Jesus in his, his confrontation of Paul, this man who had made his life's aim to persecute the church and to stop it completely, Jesus confronts Paul and he, he reveals his glory to him. And Paul repents, he trusts Christ, and Jesus tells him, you are my chosen messenger to take the gospel to the Gentile world. So he has taken Paul and he has devoted him, he has dedicated him, he has designated him for this task of explaining the gospel to the world. So that's who Paul is, but that brings us to important questions about the gospel and about Jesus. Clearly Jesus is very important, clearly this gospel is important because it's Paul's life's work to tell people about it, but what is it about Jesus that makes him so significant? And what is the gospel? And as it happens, you can't answer those questions independently of each other, right? To answer one is to answer the other. If we want to ask, what is the gospel? You have to talk about Jesus. And you, if you're going to ask, who is Jesus and why is he important? You're going to talk about the gospel. And so, the brilliance of Paul, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. Gospel just means good news, and it's a good news that's, that's declared to people to which they, they need to respond, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. And then he goes on between verses uh, 2 and 4, and, and he has a lot to say that could seem a bit overwhelming, uh, maybe a bit technical if you're unfamiliar with these things. But what he's doing is he's explaining why Jesus is so significant, who he is, and why he's devoted his life's work to telling people about him. And so I've tried to break this down along these lines. Six facts about Jesus, as declared by Paul in this opening paragraph. The first is one that, given our cultural heritage, we could easily miss, namely that he's the Christ. Right there in the opening line, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ. Christ is a title. It's not Jesus' last name. It's certainly not a, a, an exclamation uh, for, for profanity, uh, but it was understood to be, Christ was the, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Messiah. And so it meant an anointed one, and in this context, specifically an anointed or a chosen a savior or deliverer. And so we talked about that unifying thread in the Old Testament being that messianic hope. A savior is coming. A deliverer is coming. And so in Greek, the term was a Christ, the Christ, the one who is coming to rescue us from our sin. So if we were to walk into a conversation today uh, and just speak the phrase Jesus Christ, no one uh, thinks we're making a claim. They understand to whom we're referring, but we don't think, well, is he or isn't he? But in this time, to say Jesus Christ was to make a powerful claim. You're saying Jesus is the Christ. That's a, that's a claim, a proposition that now has to be discussed. It's up for debate. Is there evidence to demonstrate that this Jesus is the Christ? And so Paul gets into some of this evidence right off the bat. But this reality that this is who this Jesus is, not just a man, not just a prophet, not just a preacher of love, but the Christ, the long-promised Savior chosen by God to deliver us, this is the declaration with which Paul begins. He's the Christ, and his coming was promised by the Old Testament prophets. Verse 2, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Now you might say, wait, are we being sloppy with the grammar? Because the where does to what antecedent does that pronoun refer? He says, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. 
So is it not the gospel that was promised, this good news that was promised? Well, which good news? Verse 3, concerning his son, Jesus Christ. So that this, the message of this story of what has taken place, that story, and, and all the, the events that make it so powerful and significant and necessary to understand, all of this was promised in the Old Testament prophets. We talk about a lot of these things at Christmas. The place of his birth in this little town called Bethlehem was promised. The fact that he would die by crucifixion in Psalm 22, his hands and feet would be pierced, was promised. The fact that his death would be a propitiating and atoning, a substitutionary <laughs> sacrifice for our sins. Even that was promised in the prophet Isaiah in chapters 52 and 53. And so we could go on. The fact that he would be raised from the dead was promised. That the time of his presentation relative uh, to the empires of the old world was promised. The fact that he would be presented riding a donkey coming into Jerusalem. All of these things were prophesied in the Old Testament scriptures. And so we see these descriptions descriptions of Paul's ministry, for instance, in Luke's account, this historical account in the book of Acts, where he says Paul would go into a synagogue and reasoning, demonstrating from the scriptures, he would prove to people that Jesus is the Christ. And what we see is that central to the case that Paul makes is appealing to all these prophecies that Jesus has fulfilled. Prophecies, by the way, which no one can contrive to fulfill in an artificial way. No one has the power to determine where they're going to be born, when they're going to be born, how they're going to be executed by the empire that rules the world, and certainly whether or not they're going to come back from the dead three days later. You can't concoct or contrive or, or develop a conspiracy to, to make it look like you fulfilled those things. But Jesus fulfills all these things and dozens more because he is the promised Christ. And so we'll deal with more of those as we go along. He's the Son of God, verse 3, concerning his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. This is a title of deity, and this is clear across the New Testament, but when, when Jesus is described as the Son of God, he's the Son of God in a unique sense, not in the sense of the brotherhood of man. It, 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 there are some senses in which people say we're all children of God, and insofar as we're all the products of his divine creation and ingenuity were made in his image, yes. But that's not what we mean when we talk about Jesus as God's own son. Jesus is the one who, by his own testimony, we see this in his prayer uh, to the Lord, uh, to, to the Father in John 17 before he goes to the cross. He prays that the Father would restore to him the glory that he and the Father shared before the world existed. Uh, he tells the religious leaders, before Abraham was, I am. Two incredible claims there. One, he uses the divine name of God given to Moses in that era of the Exodus. And then he claims to be self-existent and eternal. Not I was, not somewhere along the line I came along, I am. I have always been. He exists outside of time. So when we describe Jesus as the Son of God, we're describing him as deity, as a member of the Godhead, the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Co-equal, co-eternal, that Jesus is God, has always been God. He was the agent of creation. All things exist by the word of his power. Uh, that, that he's not an angel or a prophet or some lesser spiritual being, but he is God. And in his incarnation, in his coming, God in human flesh. And this is this incredible heart of the gospel, that here we are, sinners against God, estranged from God, enemies of God, hopeless before God, a million miles away from the perfect standard of the righteousness of God. And yet Jesus, God himself comes. He takes on human flesh, not just so that he can preach to us, not just so that he can tell us to love each other a little bit more, but so that he can die in our place. And because he's eternal, because he's infinite, unbounded by time, space, or number, his once for all perfect sacrifice is sufficient to provide, to offer forgiveness to everyone everywhere. So he's the son of God and he's Lord concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And this confirms the reality of his deity and his authority. And this is also, I think, going to introduce another important concept in the gospel. And that is that the gospel is a message that requires a response. 
that commands a response. Sometimes people hear a message about Jesus and they think that's very interesting. I, I like the stuff about loving your neighbor, about being good to your enemies. Uh, that's all good, that's all important. Uh, I'll kind of add those things into the hopper of my philosophical worldview and I'll go about my business. But the gospel says to us, you're hopelessly lost in your sin, but Jesus has done all that's necessary for you to be saved and reconciled to God. So now what you must do is turn from your sin and trust in Jesus. Place all your confidence in Jesus. Believe in Jesus. And at that point, each of us has a responsibility to make a choice. You either say, yes, I will trust in Jesus, or you, or you decide, no, I trust in my own judgment that says, I don't need to do this, or I can put this off for another day. But Jesus, as Lord, is someone to whom we, we're commanded to submit. That The gospel requires a response of obedience. To say, if the God who made me, against whom I've sinned, was willing to do all this to offer reconciliation and forgiveness, how can I turn away? How can I reject that? And if I do, uh, I will have to answer for that. The Jesus who died in our place, who offers salvation, uh, is the one who will judge the world in righteousness. So he's not just a philosopher to say, let me help you with your decision making. Let me give you some principles that will reduce the friction in your marriage or in the workplace. No, he's Lord. He's God. He's the one who will be our judge. And the one who will be our judge who knows every thought and deed is offering full and free salvation now through the message of the gospel. He's from the royal line of King David. This would be significant especially for Jewish believers who knew, who knew uh, the Old Testament well. He, verse 3, he was born of the flesh, of the seed, born of the seed of David according to the flesh. This is one of these many Old Testament prophecies. Uh, that one of the details that, that's added about this profile of the coming Messiah is that he will be a descendant of King David's royal line, which is to say, kind of along with this, that he himself will be a king who will rule with judgment and justice and equity forever. And so once again, the Jesus that calls us to trust in him and be saved is the one who will reign uh, on a throne over everything, everywhere, forever. And then, one we can just read on by, but how it, it, it world-shatteringly significant, his divine identity was authenticated by his resurrection, verse 4, and declared that is proved, demonstrated to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness. I think that simply means by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the resurrection from the dead. So we can make all these claims about Jesus, but then we could ask, well, how do we know? How could we know? Well, here's how. He was raised from the dead. And as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, which is a couple of years back in the chronology of Paul's life and ministry, seen by hundreds of eyewitnesses, which at this very time, the time of the writing of this letter, would have been available for interview. You could go down to Jerusalem and say, tell me the day that you saw Jesus after he had been executed. There he was. We saw him bloody and battered and lifeless, a corpse the hope was gone, the movement was over, and then he revealed himself to us in glory and power. This is why we're here. This is why the gospel uh, is spread throughout the world. This is why we have these letters. The, the survival of the Christian movement depended upon, hinged upon, this central claim. Because the people who hated him most could not keep him dead. If they could have, no church. No Christianity, no Paul, uh, no Bible, but they killed him. He, he was demonstrated to be the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. And the people who saw him were so convinced of this reality that they devoted the rest of their lives to telling people it's real. That Messiah, that Savior, he came. We saw him alive from the dead. Trust in him and be saved. And so convinced were they of this reality that we'll take beatings, we'll take floggings. In the case of Paul, shipwreck after shipwreck and, and being stoned, being driven from town to town. The guy who could have had a cushy university tenured position over the whole course of his career is an itinerant peasant preaching from town to town. Why? Because he has seen the risen Christ and he knows whatever I've got to endure here and now, I've got salvation, reconciliation with God through Jesus. And so this is why Paul is glad 
to endure what he has to endure, to tell people about Jesus, and to fulfill this office that was given to him by Christ, to tell people about what Jesus has done. So what he says in verse 1, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. Then he says in verse 5, through him, having described Jesus, through him, we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Which is to say, how, how did we come into this role, into this position, this apostleship office? Uh, well, Jesus gave it to me. It, this Jesus commissioned Paul, and he's the one who sustains him by his grace. And when he says for obedience, he's not talking about his own obedience. He's not saying, Jesus gave me this job, and so I obey by going and doing the job. No, the thing he means is, is he goes around calling people to obedience to Christ, to call them to submit to Christ by trusting in Jesus and responding to the gospel. Through him, we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. That is what Jesus has done is for everyone is for you, is for me, is for the people in, in East Asia, in Siberia, in South America. Everyone everywhere has this universal problem. We know that there's a holy, righteous God. He's going to go on to say, Paul, in, in the second half of this chapter, uh, that God has so clearly revealed himself in the order and design of nature that everyone knows there is a God. People suppress that. They push that truth down in their hearts and minds, but it's unmistakable. And now, since the scientific revolution, more clear than ever, all the scientific advances since the 17th and 18th centuries have revealed so clearly, whether in astronomy or chemistry or biology, everywhere we look, we see information and design, specified complexity with goals in view. Everywhere we look, we see the handiwork of God's brilliance and design. And so we all know there's a God. We all know right and wrong. We can kind of modulate our consciences depending on how we sin against that, that thing that God has given within each of us. Sometimes we, we dampen that voice. But whether you're a Jew who's been raised with the written standard of God's law, or whether you're someone who was not raised with that heritage, but you have still this innate sense that God has given you, that when I do things I know I ought not to do, there's that part of you that says that was wrong and you know it. And then other times there are things that you know you should have done, and you leave that situation and you think, why didn't I do the thing I was supposed to do? Or why didn't I say the thing I should have said? We all have that because we're all sinners. And the ominous reality of human existence, the fundamental problem of the human condition, we're sinners, God is holy and righteous and bound to deal with our sin. He can't just let us in heaven's back door any more than a just judge can let people off the hook for crimes because he has a personal affinity for them. Our sin has to be, to, to, to be dealt with, has to be punished in a, in a just way. And so the glory of the gospel is Jesus took the penalty that we deserved. The cross is an act of sacrifice. Jesus came as our substitute. When Jesus was coming onto the stage in his public ministry, John the Baptist, the last Old Testament prophet chosen by God to, to point people to Christ and say, the one for whom we've been waiting is here. How does he introduce Jesus? The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What is a lamb? A lamb is, a, is an animal of sacrifice. This is unmistakably clear through all of the Old Testament. And, and those sacrifices in the Old Testament Levitical system, which seems so strange and weird and foreign to us, never in themselves had the power to take away or to atone for sin. But they pointed to the reality that one day there will be one. There will be a lamb. There will be a sacrifice. There will be a substitute who's able in his one death to pay in full for all the sins of everyone everywhere. And so the message is, he has done it. He's proved it by his resurrection from the dead. So trust in him and be saved. And so when Paul says he's been given this task for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, what he means is, I was given the job of coming and telling you, here's your problem, here's what Jesus has done, trust in him and be saved, respond to the message of God's salvation. And then he says in verse 6, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. 
And I think there's a lot packed in there as well. He means to say that these people whom he has not visited, uh, this was a church he had not founded, yet they are a part of this uh, chosen people of God, that uh, the people of God redeemed from their sin because they have trusted in the Jesus whom Paul declares. And I think there also may be a little more than that involved. I think this is a kind of a statement of Paul's sphere of authority as given to him by Jesus. If there are those who might ask, well, yeah, we, we trusted in Jesus and we're doing just fine. So who are you, Paul, to write to us and to tell us how all this is supposed to work? Well, Paul would say, uh, well, I'm an apostle of the Jesus Christ in whom you've trusted, uh, the one who commissioned me to take the message to all nations, including you, right? And so as he told the Corinthians in the second letter, uh, I'm not overextending myself in, in my instruction for you. Uh, I have a sphere of authority that was given to me by God, a sphere that includes you. And so it is with, with, with the Roman church. This wasn't a church that Paul had founded, but Paul had been chosen by Jesus Christ to take the message of the gospel to the Gentile world. So Paul wants them to know uh, that includes you, and I'm stoked to get to fulfill this ministry toward you all. So, that's a bit about Paul. Why Paul is significant? The short answer, Jesus, the gospel. Because Jesus has come. He's paid for our sins. Paul gets to be the one to go tell people, trust in him and be saved. Secondly, audience, verses 7 through 13. Again, a short summary to the saints in Rome. I've been praying for you and planning to come to you. Verse 7, to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making requests, if by some means now at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Now I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. So you see Paul here just candidly sharing his heart in writing this letter and his intentions to come visit them. You see his excitement uh, in, in his... The, the, the fact that his apostle's heart is thrilled over their condition in verse 8. Uh, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. That is Rome being this hub of civilization, the heart of the empire. There's a group of believers in Jesus there, the reputation of whom has begun to spread through the whole, whole empire. Paul hasn't been there. I think it's clear that at this time, uh, no apostle has been there to give an apostolic instruction to this church. As I mentioned last time, that the tradition that it was the apostle Peter who founded the church in Rome uh, is a late tradition from about 400 years later with no evidence to support it. I think it's clear uh, that that hasn't been the case. And so Paul, as I mentioned last time, I think in writing this letter is essentially giving them in written form the, the Christian discipleship curriculum through which he would take all the churches that he founded. Whether he was there for a few months or a year or a year and a half, he wanted to make sure they understood who Jesus is, what he's done, what the gospel requires, and what Christian living ought to look like. Life in the body of Christ and life out in the workplace, the marketplace, the family, in town, now that you're a Christian. And he answers all those questions here. And I think he, he, first he begins by thanking God that there's this church here, they're flourishing, they're doing well, and, and he's thrilled. This is not a, a correction for them or a condemnation of them. He starts with this gratitude for them, and he's going to offer up this letter as, as his service to them. And he goes on to say that I've, I've been stoked to come and to try to help you, to encourage you, to, to impart uh, the, the, the benefit of my teaching and help to you. And he also wants to be encouraged uh, by, by their seeing their enthusiasm, their growth, their stability in the gospel when he comes. Verse 9, for God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit of the gospel of the Son, that without ceasing, just means without stopping, I make mention of you always in my prayers. That is, I want you to know I'm praying for you constantly, which would be an awesome thing, right? Here you're at church. There, as we'll see as we go on, there's going to be a lot of questions and concerns that Paul answers in this church. Uh, it, these are the questions that Paul's dealt with everywhere he goes. And so Paul wants them to know, I've never been there. 
Uh, but I'm praying for you guys all the time. We'll see at the end of the letter, Paul does know all kinds of people at that church from all the traveling all over the Mediterranean world that Christians at this time were doing. And we see specifically what he's praying, making requests, if by some means now at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. So I'm thanking God for your Christian testimony that you're doing so well. I pray for you all the time. And mostly what I'm praying is that God would give me an opportunity to come and to minister in Rome. And as we know, that will come in the life of Paul, kind of circuitously, and not the way he, he planned, but it, it's certainly coming. And then we begin to see uh, the, the heart of this letter, verse 13. Now, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now, that I might also have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. I am a debtor, both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to unwise. So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And that brings us to purpose. And in, in making this transition from audience to purpose, we probably should say a little bit more about what we might be able to surmise about the demographic layout here. <laughs> Uh, we know that there are Jews in this context. We know that there are Gentiles. Paul's going to get to the questions that have to do with Jews and Gentiles in the body of Christ not offending each other because of their prior cultural sensibilities. But one of the big battles that Paul has fought everywhere he goes is the threat of the Judaizers. And we should clarify that if you're new to these things, this is not an anti-Semitic thing, an anti-Jewish thing. Paul, a Jew. Jesus, a Jew. Uh, Jesus came as the Savior for everyone everywhere, and also that meant as the Savior, the Messiah of the Jewish people. And so when, when I say that Paul was fighting this battle of the Judaizers, we're not talking about there was some sort of personal animosity toward ethnic Jews, but rather there were people raised in the cultural and religious Jewish heritage who were seeing, okay, here's the message, Jesus fulfilled all of that, now trust in him and be saved. Okay, but we got a lot of stuff God gave us. We got these, these feast days to keep and all these various dietary laws and all kinds of stuff that it seems like God requires of us. So it looks to us like it's believe in Jesus and keep all these Old Testament Jewish laws. That was a battle that Paul had to fight everywhere because what we saw so clearly in First and Second Corinthians is that if you're trusting in Jesus and also your adherence to a system of religious deeds, then there's a portion of your salvation which is now dependent on your religious performance. And now you're back into the Martin Luther problem. If there's a system of things that I have to keep, I'm not going to be good enough. I'm going to fail. I'm going to slip up somewhere. There's probably going to be some area that I don't even realize I'm slipping up. And so the glory of Jesus was that he came and ratified this new covenant. <laughs> and all the Old Testament rites, the, the sacrificial system, the feast days, all of these things were glimpses and glimmers of the once-for-all sacrifice to come. As Paul will tell the Colossians, a shadow of the things to come, the substance is Christ himself. And so we know a little bit about some of the um, political intrigue of the time. A few years before this, I think we're, we're looking at like the winter of 56, 57, A.D., off the top of my head here, <laughs> around 49 A.D., the emperor Claudius kicked all the Jews out of Rome. Uh, and there was a dispute, the historians tell us, about one Crestus, which people think was a mishearing uh, of, of Christus, Christus, Christ, that there were arguments, there were disputes about the nature of Christ, and probably uh, it, it was surrounding the things I've just described. There were Jews uh, who had come to faith in Christ and were telling people, guys, our Messiah has come. No longer are we languishing in hope or anticipating the time when he will come. He has come. And there were other Jews who were rejecting that entirely on board with the religious leaders who in envy had killed Christ as a blaspheming imposter. And then there were some who were confused. Okay, maybe, but let's not let go all the heritage of the laws that God gave us to keep. And apparently, uh, all the hostility and fighting about all of that, Emperor Claudius says, hey, 
No more Jews in Rome. Get out. I'm tired of this. And so that's how Paul comes to meet Aquila and Priscilla, who are Jewish believers. Paul meets them uh, in Acts 18. You can read about that. They had been in Rome, but Claudius said, I'm, I'm tired of this. All this rabble-rousing back and forth. And in those days, thankfully this is less so now, but theological debates could easily degenerate into fisticuffs, right? You see this kind of thing with Gallio and the back and forth and the beat down to the judgment seat. These days, people fight on the internet. I don't commend that. I think it's mostly a, a vacuous enterprise. But very seldom do you have, you're having like a debate with your Calvinist friend and you go, all right, let's take it outside. And then it turns into like a big riot. But in those days, your theological debates could quickly turn into a big riot. Claudius says no more. Claudius dies, I think in 54. And so it looks like the edict that kicked all the Jews out of the city of Rome died with him. And so Paul writes probably three to four years after that. So some of what's going on may be that the, the, the makeup of the Christian church in Rome suddenly for five years was nothing but Gentile. And now for three or four years, there's been a lot of Jews who've come back into the situation. And that's going to raise a lot of questions about life together. And then for all those who were saying, look, what, what have you guys done while we've been gone? You're doing away with the Old Testament stuff? And then there's going to be people, as is, I think, the case in every New Testament letter, who are just trying to sort it all out, just trying to make up their mind. Like, okay, we have the Old Testament. I mean, it, it's real. It came from God. Moses was there on the mountain. The lightning, the thunder came down. His face was shining. That, that all came from God. And yet we see what we're, you're saying about Jesus and the resurrection. That's powerful. All these prophecies he's fulfilled. How, how do we make sense of all this? Is God done with Israel? What about the necessity of us to perform up to this religious standard? All these really important Jewish questions, along with these questions about how we're going to relate to each other in the body of Christ. And so I think there's a a, a big part of the, the purpose of Paul and the way he lays out the gospel here is to answer those kinds of questions. That everywhere he goes, there are people who are confused, and then there are Jewish false teachers who are actively working to subvert the gospel by calling people back to observing the trappings of a system that Jesus has fulfilled. So Paul's going to answer all that stuff. How does the Old Testament relate to the New? What about Israel? What about our religious performance? What about life in the body of Christ now that we're Jew and Gentile together? All of that's coming, and that's why he's so stoked about this. I'm ready to preach the gospel to you. I'm not ashamed of it. It's the power of God to save. When he says in verse 14, I am a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to unwise. That sounds weird, right? Like Paul is everybody money? No, that's not what he's saying. That, I, that based on the, the role that God has given me, uh, if I'm obligated, I owe the gospel to everybody, to you as much as anybody else. That it wasn't God told me, hey, just go, uh, you know, be a pastor in this town or just go tell this one people group. But no, I'm responsible to use my life to tell as many people as I can about Jesus. The rich, the poor, the cultured, the educated, the barbarians. Uh, barbarian was a word that came from uh, the, the, the Greeks and Romans mockery of people who didn't speak uh, Latin or didn't speak Greek because when they talked, it sounded like bar, 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 bar. And so that's where barbarian came from. And it was a term of derision. And the, the idea that there would be you know, ethnic hostility or one people group that looked down upon another, not new phenomenons. Uh, those things have been going on down through the ages. And so Paul means to say, uh, I want everybody everywhere to know about Jesus. That's my job. So as much as is in me, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the good news of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. That is, the message came to the Jews first. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And running out of time, we might have to talk about that a little bit more next time. I think the idea there is from start to finish, the whole program in God's design is by faith. It's not like you trust in him by faith, and then you get on the work salvation program, or you work your way, and then you start believing. No, what does God require? Faith. When does he save you? When you believe in Jesus Christ. And you may wonder about that not ashamed language. Why would Paul be ashamed? And well, there would be all kinds of reasons. One, because it's the message that God had beat everywhere he went. 
people would throw rocks at him and say, let's go out and throw rocks at this guy until he stops moving, and then we'll be done. How about that? You might be ashamed about the message at that point. And then there was also all kinds of slander and blasphemy. People would say, hey, isn't this the guy that's, that's blaspheming the Old Testament, that's, that's talking down the law of God given to us by Moses? Isn't this the guy that tells us it doesn't matter how you live? It's grace. Grace means do whatever you want. And so there were all these false accusations against Paul. He's going to deal with all of them, but he wants them to know, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because what I bring is the one and only message of salvation, of rescue, of redemption, of reconciliation, of new eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. So just to highlight kind of the, the, the main thread of what we've seen here, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the saints in Rome, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you. So, if verses 1 through 6 give us a summary of who Jesus is, these verses, 15 to 17, tell us how we access the benefits of what he has done by faith to everyone who believes. Start to finish, it's faith that God requires, and much of the remainder of this book will be devoted to explaining and defending that thesis. Just faith? Well, what about good works? What about Abraham? What about the law? What about the promises of Israel? All good questions that Paul sees coming, and he's going to show it's always been the case that God has always known we could never save ourselves, and what he's after is our faith. And the, the important thing is the object of our faith. This is not faith in faith, belief in a higher power, hope for a better day somewhere out there. This is faith in Jesus, yeah. the one who has come, the Son of God, God in human flesh. He's paid the price of our sins in full. He's declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. And he's offering salvation to whoever believes, whoever trusts in him. So, Here's Romans 1, verses 1 through 17.